every Sunday, the place to be is Worship Harvest Nalia. It's for you who loves the progi. and I'm calling in, dialing in, here at Worship Harvest Nalia. We're so happy to host you this morning to our garage services. We have so much happening, and today is all about thanksgiving. So we're going to celebrate God with our thanks by just giving thanks. We have so much to be grateful for. So we're just giving thanks all morning and all day today. We're very happy for everyone to join in this morning. We have our online audience. We see you. We see you get out of those beds. Go to the nearest location. We have uh, services happening here in Nalia. We have services happening in Gayaza, Chibuye, the 58 locations. Just get online. Find out which one is closest to you and get, get, get up and let's go and join. But for now, we are just getting into business garage. Business garage. And the theme for this month is oil and gas. So there's so much to learn. We've been asking ourselves, Uganda, how are we as Omutu Wawansi going to get into the oil and gas industry and tap into that money, that oil money, so we call it. And now, Business Garage has organized a whole month, a whole month of lessons in which we can tap. So let's get into it, let's get into it, let's get online, let's share the link, share the link, it's about to reach you, share the link every time you see it. There'll be links coming in for garage, business garage, sorry, there'll be links coming in for the encounter service, which is at 9 a.m., there'll be links coming in for YXP here in Nalia, so 11.30 we'll have the youth experience, and then there'll be links coming in from, from um, any other event that's going to happen today. So get, get, get engaged. Get out of those beds. Get your cup of coffee. I have mine. I have mine. Get your cup of coffee and let us just get into the morning. We're very excited to have you. I'm just wondering right now, where else could, could a worship harvester who has no idea that there's a location near them join? So we have locations even outside of Uganda. We have a location in the United Kingdom, Worship Harvest UK, woo woo woo! And that um, location meets on Liverpool Street. Pass Evangeline, I know you're watching. Hi, Worship Harvest Germany, Worship Harvest Nairobi, we see you, we know you're watching, we love you. Worship Harvest Kigali, yay, yay, yay! We see you, we know you're watching. So there are locations all over the world and some are coming up, and today we're actually going to celebrate a few more. So get ready, get excited. Garage is happening, garage is happening. We also have um, the new members lunch today. Many of us did what we call the discipleship, uh, discovering membership class. That's very confusing sometimes. Discovering membership class. And in the discovering membership class, we just learn more about who Worship Harvest is, what Worship Harvest is, and we are very, very excited that we have some new members joining the movement. So we have the new members lunch today. If you did the discovering membership class, I got it right this time, we are ready to host you to the new members lunch. Don't miss it. In different locations, it's happening at different times. I'm sure you have received that news. So get engaged. And the next discovering membership class will be next month. But we also have the Thrive Business Breakfast. Thrive Business Breakfast happens every Thursday morning from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. It has been four amazing sessions, and we're now at the climax. It's going to be the fifth session. Get ready for it. Get ready for it. Get ready for it. Just pay that 50000 if you haven't already, and let us get ready for it. So, um, we're, we're ready for 
for all of you to come into the room. If you have received the link, share it, share it, share it, share it far and wide on all your social media platforms. We're ready, ready, ready for you. And I wish you could ask any other questions, but just get into the room and your questions will be answered. Thank you so much. We're ready for you. Woo -hoo -hoo! Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Business Era today. Can I hear some noise from those of us in the room? I never want to worry about it.
Business Garage. Are you excited to be here today? Yes! Can you give the worship team a hand? Can you give your neighbor a quick high five, a quick high five? Welcome them, thank them for coming for Business Garage. Those of you that are joining us online, you are very, very welcome. You can have your seats in the, in, in the house. You are very, very welcome. Um, thank you so much for being with us. If, if you're a first-time guest and maybe you're watching us online, just let us know in the chat. We'd like to welcome you, love on you, and, um, and, and get to connect with you so you can plug into this family. Amen. Amen. Why well, are some people not happy? We're happy. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. All right. So um, right now, we usually continue with our giving, with our worship through giving. Amen. So I hope you've prepared your offering. You've prepared your offertory because here we don't come to the house of the Lord empty handed. I know you're excited to give. But first, before we do that, as worship harvest, who are we? We are a movement of the gospel discipleship and all right and what are we committed to what is our purpose we are committed to catalyzing spiritual social and economic renewal in our immediate communities and as a result and here we believe that church begins on monday and sunday is garage time Oh yeah, you got that right. That's what we believe here. We believe that you come here to be equipped so you can go and function as the church, as the hope, as the light in the world, Monday to Saturday. And so, uh, as I would said earlier, we are going to continue worshiping the Lord with our giving. So I hope you have your giving ready. I'm going to pray a blessing over it. And as we give, the worship team will come and minister to it. So I hope you prepared your giving. I'm going to just pray a blessing over it. Um, Father, we thank you um, for the blessing um, that you have given us. Thank you that you have enabled us not to come to your house empty-handed today. And so we, I pray a blessing over everyone who is giving in your house this morning. But your word will be true to them that you will make all grace abound toward them that they will always have all sufficiency in all things for every 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 good work for the glory of your name in jesus name we pray amen if you're giving online our numbers are can you help me put up the numbers for those of us that are giving online our numbers are 0778 618 418 or 0758 618 418 the momo pay um, number is 148 722 the Airtel Pay is 1160032. And if you're giving through the website, it is worshipharvest.org forward slash give. You'll be able to find um, more giving platforms there. Can we put our hands together and welcome the worship team? We are going to worship together even as we give. Amen. Creator of the heavens, seated with the Lord. 
Breakfast Series. Right. The Business Leaders Breakfast Series. Hi, my name is Tony Atida and I'm reporting live from the Thrive Business Breakfast. Today we've learned about Profits First. Do you know that you have to pay yourself a profit for starting that business? My name is Catherine Hamia, Chief Steward of the Upper Room Apartments. Today we've had an incredible teaching from Director Grace on Profit First Principle. My key highlight is that Profit First is a cash management system and my key takeaway has been the foundational accounts that help our businesses thrive. And I'm going to, uh, my implementation is to make sure that I put away money against the different, uh, against the different foundation accounts. And the goal is for the business to become better, not bigger, but better and thriving. My name is Rebecca Mahande, Deputy Principal at Harvest International School. I'm great. I'm very happy to have been part of Thrive Business Breakfast this morning. We have learned about a great principle that talks about profit first. So for us at Harvest, we have implemented this where the cash that we have, the school fees that has been paid is what we actually consider as king because then we have money to run the school. Every school needs money to run. So please, Profit first is what you need to implement as a principle. My name is Dr. Stephen Mugabe from Code Clinic. And today at the Thrive Business Breakfast, I've learned that if I don't change anything about uh, how I manage my cash for the business, then nothing will change. The big monster that is expenses keeps growing with the revenue that you get. So I am encouraged to go and start the principles of profit first. Uh, save profit, allocate percentages to profits and uh, taxes and owners pay and all that so that my business gets better, not just grows bigger but gets better. I can have something turned over. Yeah, I would encourage you come and attend Thrive because if you don't come nothing will change in your business. There's a lot of nuggets to pick up from here that are actionable. Good morning, good morning, Business Garage. You're welcome to Business Garage this Sunday morning. I want to hear some shouts in the house. For those in the house, you're very welcome. Our online audience, you're also very, very welcome to Business Garage. Now, this morning at Business Garage, we have very interesting things to tell you. But just before we start, I want to request you to share the link. Share the link. Share it with your friends, business uh, friends, partners, families, name it. Because what we're about to download is something very critical and important for us this morning. I want to send out greetings to everyone out there, our online audience at different locations. Uh, those who will watch during the week, you're very welcome. Greetings to Apmo and Revma, the vision bearers of Business Garage. We send greetings to you as well. So thank you for joining us at Business Garage. Uh, this morning... First of all, the whole of last month, we've been uh, bringing guests here from different organizations uh, that are run by government who facilitate businesses for us in, in this country. And uh, the point of Business Garage really to emphasize is that we are teaching people or we are equipping business people to run their businesses with biblical principles. And that is why we're here, because God is interested in our businesses. God is not only interested in your life or your community, but also is interested in the profit that you make in your businesses. But most of all, what you do with the money that you make and how you solve people's problems, or rather you solve problems out there in the communities that you're in or in the countries. So this morning or this month, first of all, we are going to go through uh, a series uh, that we call the oil and gas business opportunities. We are going to be exploring the business opportunities in oil and gas and this morning we have with us the regulator of the sector. Uh, let's put our hands together and welcome Gloria Sevikari. You're very welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Now, we've been very blessed that Petroleum Authority has sent us two guests. You know? Two guests. Uh, and Alex is with us in the audience and we're going to have a chat with everyone after the session. So, let's take off now, Gloria. We want, uh, we want you to tell us, first of all, tell us about you. Who is Gloria? Send out shouts, uh, greetings to your friends, neighbors, employers, employees, etc. Uh, thank you, Pavi Kari. I'm the manager for corporate affairs and public relations at the Petroleum Authority of Uganda, which is the regulator. Uh, we ensure that the oil and gas business in the country 
is done in line with our laws and regulations, but also international best practice. Does that cover biblical principles? <laughs> we'll see. Send, out, send greetings to someone. Uh, shout out to my colleagues in the audience. I see Alex. I see Kato. Those online, please drop a thumbs up or a high five because I know I work and live with a lot of people that uh, pray and worship here. Uh, family, friends, uh, Mabel, Susan, and everyone else, shout out to you and I hope you're tuned in. Awesome. So friends, prepare questions. Uh, right now, Gloria is representing the oil and gas regulator. So prepare all your questions. So Gloria, let's take off now. Tell us about the authority. Who are you? What do you do? What's your mandate in this nation? So our mandate as the authority is to ensure that the work that is being done in the oil and gas sector is uh, in line with the laws and regulations, but also international best practice, meaning that the sector creates value for us as a country, and that means for the Ugandans uh, that own the oil and gas resource, because according to the constitution, the resources are held by government in trust for the people. So we make sure that as this work is going on, it is bringing value to the country, to the Ugandans, but also the investors that we partner with, the people that spend their money to do that work, get a good return on the investment. Of course, we do not work alone as the authority. We work with uh, all the other government institutions, some that you've hosted here, but the two other principal institutions are the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development, uh, that is our policy head, and so the ministry is in charge of policy and attracting investment into the sector. So when the investment comes in, the authority, the Petroleum Authority, regulates what is being done. The other principal uh, institution is the Uganda National Oil Company. This is a business sector. This is a sector where people want to make money, where the country wants to make money. So the Uganda National Oil Company looks at government's commercial interest. So the sector is run in line with regulatory best practice so that we have checks and balances among the different institutions. Awesome. So let's, let's unpack that, you know? We're going to unpack that because to technical people, it makes a lot of sense. To a simple businessman, it might not make sense. So tell us, when you say oil and gas sector, what are you referring to? Okay. Um, I wish we had the whole day, but we don't. So I'll try and break it down as simply as I can. So when we talk about the oil and gas business, there are three main phases that we call upstream, midstream, and downstream. When you talk of upstream, you're saying we are looking for oil. Do we have it in the ground? And if we have it, can we produce it? So after we have produced it, what happens? That is where the next phase comes in the midstream. You want to make it commercial. You want to make money from it. So once you have produced your oil, how do you make money? You make money by selling it. So you can sell it as crude oil and you export it to the international market. As Uganda, we are landlocked or landlinked, so we, expect, ex, we would export through another country. But again, when you have produced it, you can also commercialize it by refining to get the products that we know, the diesel, the petrol, jet fuel, what we use in our cars, the paraffin, etc. So you can commercialize through export as crude oil, but you can also commercialize through refining. So you build a refinery in the country that will process your crude oil and give you the products. Now the last phase, the third phase that we call the downstream, once you have produced and exported or refined, how does it get to you, the consumer? How do you get it into your cars? That is what we call the downstream. The downstream looks at sell, sales, distribution, and marketing of petroleum products, which are either imported into the country, as we are doing now, or as we plan to have in future, refined. So those are the three phases that make up the oil and gas business. All right, wow. So there's the upstream, comes out of the ground, midstream, uh, tr move it, transport it, store it, refine it, and then the downstream. The downstream. So we are used to the downstream. We see petrol stations everywhere. Exactly. We buy fuel, you take your car for servicing, all that is downstream. downstream. So the thing that we are getting exposed to now is both upstream, upstream and, and midstream. midstream. So as the authority, we regulate the upstream 
and midstream. The downstream that is related to the petrol stations, the price of fuel, etc., is still regulated by the Ministry of Energy. <laughs> because someone has already asked, please tell us I have why answered. fuel prices are going up, and the answer is there. We have no answer for you right now. So your interest is in upstream and midstream. So, and this is where the current opportunities are that we want to look at and, and tap into. So just start by telling us, one of the things you mentioned is that you want to ensure that value remains in Uganda. Uh, because uh, you, you mentioned that the infrastructure is not set up by Ugandans mm -hmm. because we can't afford. So we need to retain as much value as possible in country. And that's where people watching there are, are interested. Mm -hmm. They don't want to know about anything. They just want to say, how can I come and plug in there? And is it, what's, the, what's the point? Is it viable? What opportunities are there? So now let's start leaning into that. Okay. Me and other people out there, how can we come and uh, make money from the, the, the sector that you're regulating? Okay. In order for us to have the conversation about how we can make money, we need to understand what are the projects that are bringing the value. So uh, Uganda confirmed commercial quantities of oil in 2006, and we have figures uh, estimated 6.5 billion barrels of oil, but because of the geology, the technical nature of the way oil is underground, you never recover everything. So the estimated recoverable is about 1.4 billion. How are we going to recover? Now in the upstream, we have to produce the oil. So there are two projects that are being uh, implemented to help us produce the oil. One is called the Kingfisher Project, and it's in Hoima and Chikube district. Chikube is a fairly new district, but it was part of Hoima, and that is uh, being operated by Sinok Uganda Limited from China. And then we have a second project called the Tilenga Project that is also going to produce oil from Bulisa and Nwoya districts that's being operated by Total Energies from France. So those two projects combined are going to produce about 230,000 barrels of oil per day. So there's a whole host of infrastructure that's going to be set up to produce these resources. We have pipelines, we have processing facilities, we have uh, feeder lines. It is just to help produce the oil. Now, those two projects alone uh, have an estimated value of about seven billion dollars. Seven billion dollars. Seven. Seven billion dollars. Dollars. To put it into Let's context. Let that sink in. Yes. Properly. In seven context. Seven billion dollars. Yes. <laughs> the biggest project that we have seen as a country is the Karuma Hydropower Project, which is about 1.2 billion dollars. Okay. Now. When we now move to the midstream to commercialize, so if we produce from these two projects in Hoima and Bulisa, we have to commercialize. So we have two, com two commercialization projects. We have the East African Crude Oil Pipeline, which is a 1,400 kilometer pipeline that will run from Hoima up to Tanga in Tanzania to export some crude oil to the international market. It's about three to four billion dollars project. Now, the other commercialization project, as I hinted, is the refinery, the Uganda refinery, which is going to be developed in Hoima. It's also about $4 billion. So that when we talk about these projects, we're talking about a $15 billion project in the country. Now, when you look at the support infrastructure, because you've talked of other government agencies, roads have been constructed in the areas, uh, ICT infrastructure has been extended, power lines, we have a, an industrial park, a petroleum-based industrial park, where Uganda's second international airport is being constructed. So when you look at that, the value of all these projects past the support infrastructure is 15 to 20 billion dollars. So now we ask ourselves, of this 15 billion, what can, where do Ugandans come in? Because uh, oil and gas is a global sector, but we believe and experience has shown the greatest value that we'll get from this sector is not when we wait for the oil to come out of the ground, but in this process of investing this $15 billion, the next three to four years, there's intense infrastructure development. How are Ugandans going to be part 
of the projects? How are they going to get contracts? How are they going to become service providers? Are Ugandans getting jobs? Are they getting skills? So as the Petroleum Authority of Uganda, one of the areas that we regulate is what we call national content development. And this refers to the participation of Ugandans and Ugandan businesses in the sector. Now, in regulating this, we have certain tools. We have laws and regulations, I won't go through that, that uh, provide a priority to Ugandan businesses that ring fence 16 specific goods and services for Ugandans, but also uh, provide uh, uh, aspects of skills development and training. Now, in bringing companies to do this work, so the oil companies issue out contracts and say, okay, we want to construct this facility. It, might, it, it will not be a Ugandan company to construct a, processing, a $2 billion processing facility. But this company that comes in to construct this facility will subcontract up to three or four levels. And so we know that much as a Ugandan company may not be the one, of, the one in charge of contract, uh, constructing, there are construction works like site clearance works, civil works which are ring-fenced for Ugandans, land surveying, uh, ICT services, human resource recruitment. So if you look at our laws, we have 16 areas that have been set aside for Ugandans. So that is your first point of reference. But we also say that outside these areas, priority has to be given to Ugandans. If there is no Ugandan company, the next stage is joint ventures. So Ugandan companies can also look out for uh, foreign companies that they can partner with to get the necessary capital, to get the necessary skill and technology to get some of these contracting opportunities. If you go onto our website, we have a portal under the national content for the procurement page, uh, for procurements that are coming out of this sector. So that, to someone, it might, someone that might seem a bit high level, but it's important to understand that even the opportunities that come for the SMEs will come through this higher level. These other contractors that come in and subcontract at different levels. For example, if uh, a contractor comes and sets up an office in, in Kampala, they'll need furniture, they'll need fittings, they'll need uh, office supplies, and that is where a lot of the SMEs come in. We call it a tier two or tier three uh, contracting opportunities. And so that is a snapshot of how uh, Ugandan businesses can come into the sector. Thank you so much, Gloria. Uh, just to, 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 to shed some context. I know there's one major thing we've also talked about, the thing of people and uh, accommodation and food. Because most of business people who are, like, where can we bring our food? Because it's perishable. Just to paint a picture of the size of the project, because someone can think, uh, okay, people, anyone opens up an office at any one time, uh, what's going to be the, the change in, in our business? That surge. I know at one time, uh, uh, most of the apartments in Kololo were fully booked before this stage. Tell us about those opportunities, okay? Uh, if I'm to paint a picture of the hotel industry, for example, one of the, I think the biggest, one of the, some of the biggest hotels have about 200 rooms, 230 rooms, but that place is going to have how many? 5,000 people? So you can imagine you're transporting, if a hotel like Sheraton has 230 something rooms, so you're going to have 10 plus need of accommodation and food and water and shelter, all those kind of things. So those opportunities. Now that now because earlier this year we had what we call the final investment decision announced where the companies were saying we are going to commit this money to the projects. So between then and now, about six, seven months, we've had close to 5,000 5, to 6,000 people already engaged in these projects. So when you talk about how uh, the ordinary person can plug in, especially what you are talking about are the induced opportunities, the ones where they are supplying the food, uh, they are doing uh, different services, office supplies, and the like. We have a platform that was uh, provided for by law, but to give visibility 
people, especially into these Hoima, Bulisa areas where the works are going on. As you've said, the hotel industry there is booming, and these hotels are also contracting people. And so these are not, so the hotels do not contract through us. This is what we call induced opportunities. It's important to understand the level of opportunities. If you are going to work directly with the companies, if you're going to work directly with a contractor who is going to build a processing facility, then you have to register with us. But if you're going to supply a hotel, if you're going to supply an office like a bank, the banks have all opened, in, all banks are now in Hoima, then you don't have to register with us. But the thing is that the oil and gas business is giving Ugandan businesses an opportunity to formalize their structures because, uh, and you would know this better, one of the key challenges businesses find is that they don't keep record and so they do not know how they're performing. And so when you have all these requirements in check, then you're able to know how your business is doing and, and, follow tr and keep track. Then secondly, it's also giving visibility to Ugandan companies. We've for long been asked, are Ugandans really participating in the sector? Yes, they are. In 2020, we published online a list of 300 Ugandan companies that have been engaged for different uh, goods, works, and services. So yes, Ugandan companies are coming in. And for the, for the SMEs, it's important that you also uh, aspire to meet the standards because one of the things that the oil and gas sector is it's global but also it's very high standards and it's not high standards to cut out people it is high standards because of the level of investment the safety requirements if you are supplying food to a camp how do you package it how do you clean it how do you store it those are the things that they will look at you know, you have to aspire to achieve these standards because once you achieve these standards, we've worked with the export promotion board that says that once you achieve some of these standards, you are export ready, you are ready to serve even the international market. So those are some of the things that businesses have to look at as they aspire to do work in the oil and gas sector. Okay, thanks, uh, Gloria. And I'm going to digress a bit there. Too. You talked about people, 160,000 people employed. Yes. What kind of people? Because now there are also people who are watching who are mm. who have one jobs and yeah. looking for jobs. Mm -hmm. They also need to probably raise their standard, but there are people who are currently out there and are not aware. What kind of jobs are those that people can plug into? And I know there is something also. And so there are jobs for degree holders, but they are the minority. They are less than ten percent. A lot of the workers are for technical skills, what we call the blue collar workers or the basic skills. So you have like over 2,500 welders that will be required. You have construction workers uh, now, the phase that is going on, there's a lot of construction work going on. And so, and this very much resonates with government's current policy of, of uh, promoting vocational education. And what we are doing now with the different partners is to bring the international accreditation in country. So we have schools like the Uganda Petroleum Institute at Chigumba that is now offering the international, different international certifications. We have different technical skills, uh, schools in uh, Lira. I think there's another in Fort Porto that have been upskilled by the Ministry of Education and Sports. But we also have private players that have now come into this space. Uh, companies like QSourcing, uh, the Skills Assessment Center. We have uh, Seawall and Uganda Driving Agency. Because a lot of these uh, equipment are going to be transported by trucks and they need heavy, good drive, heavy goods vehicles drivers. And these drivers have to be not your ordinary driver, drivers who drive uh, not bearing in mind the safety requirements, you know. They have to be trained and they have to know how, because they are driving, when you're driving you are also impacting people's safety. And so the drivers have to be skilled and so there's a lot of skilling going on uh, to help people who have, we have welders for example, we have drivers that have been doing this work and so what we are doing is bringing these people on board. You skill them for about three to six months, give them the certification, and they are ready to work on these different projects. 
All right, thanks, Lorian. We are going to come back to that, just to pack it. But I want to encourage you guys to ask lots of questions online. Mm -hmm. uh, Mabs M is asking, how does a farmer in Bulisa benefit from this industry? How does a farmer in Bulisa benefit from this industry? Um, okay, one of the things that uh, the different partners are doing, government with the companies, is to organize the farmers into farmers groups and cooperatives, and they are off takers that are buying produce from farmers. We have, we've worked with uh, companies like the Stanbic Business Incubator. They have an agribusiness hub in Hoima that teaches farmers on how to uh, uh, use better methods of farming, but also how to package their produce, how to clean their produce, how to store it so that this, this produce can meet the required standards. And indeed, a lot of farmers are now uh, supplying the oil and gas projects. We have done studies that show the different requirements in terms of uh, what foodstuffs, what vegetables, and this is published online. We have, uh, if you visit our website under publications, we have a lot of material that we've published to give people the information. And so for specifically for the local farmers, they are off takers that are now, that work with the companies that manage the camps where the workers stay to come in and uh, take the produce from the farmers. But it starts with also training them because you're not going to give a tomato or a sweet potato that's full of, of mud. You have to clean your produce, you have to package it, and these are the basic skills. You know, when, when we talk of standards, people think it's, it's high level, but these are the basic things, you know? Do you clean your, where do you do your work from? If you have a, a butchery or an abattoir, how is it? Do you have the right, uh, have you processed your meat? Have you processed your beef? What is the area that you, how is the area, the hygiene in the area? And these are the standards that people need to appreciate and not run away from because <laughs> they, help us to get <laughs> they help us to get better. You know, last week we had, last, this month we had Bureau of Standards and they were telling us the same things. Mm -hmm. Movement engagements are run quarterly by the different oil companies and their contractors and they focus on different areas. So you may find like for this quarter, one company is talking about standards, another one is talking about the logistics industry, another one is talking about agriculture and food hygiene, another one is talking about the civil works, talking to uh, construction companies. And then also as the authority, we run what we call annual national content conferences. The last one was held in June and the proceedings are still online on, on our YouTube page. So what we did in those conferences is we bring together the oil companies but also their contractors doing work so that the contractors take the general public through their experience, the challenges they've gone through, but also um, I would just encourage everyone to look out for this information. We try and advertise it on our social media handles, so please follow, like our Twitter, <laughs> LinkedIn pages, because when there's an engagement, it might not run on the radio, but it will, if there's an engagement and there's a YouTube link, we post it there. So if you're not invited to the physical engagement, the online one is free. So there's a lot of information out there. There are these engagements, but there are also special trainings that uh, you talked of uh, UNBS is doing with uh, the different contractors to see that, okay, if we are talking about uh, civil works and you're going to import certain machinery, what are the standards? Are the people, the companies registered for civil works aware of these, uh, this different machinery that's coming in? And then we are also running a project with African Development Bank that's training, uh, the target is to train 200 micro, small, and medium enterprises along the pipeline route. The eco pipeline goes through 10 districts from Hoima to Chotera. So we're looking at 200 SMEs, looking at youth-led SMEs, women-led SMEs, who may not plug into these high level, bigger direct opportunities, but there's going to be an influx of people in these areas. If people are in hotels, if people are are looking for different supplies in their shops, in their stores, how can they plug into, how can they get themselves ready for this influx of people that uh, is coming through? Awesome, thank you. And as business people, being entrepreneurial, you find opportunities. 
see cooperatives and you go and capture them. Yeah. So it's an opportunity also to diversify mm -hmm. uh, with wisdom, with partnerships, to see what, how you can plug in. Mm -hmm. I want to take you now national. Uh, oil is a resource given to us by God. Mm -hmm. So are other resources. Yes. And for a long time yes. as nations in Africa, as Uganda, we've been crying how all the resources are actually taken out, harnessed and returned as different mm -hmm. products. So I want us, you to tell us, one, why it's, because this, thing, this aspect is also helping business people understand why we're here and why we must actually plug in. Mm. One of your mandates is to remain, retain value here. Yeah. And some of those things we cannot, like we cannot bring, we, don't, we can't afford or even think about the drilling industry. Mm -hmm. But there are things that we can tap into and re retain here. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that if, for example, we set up the refinery, that can, alone can change the nation. So tell us, what value do you expect as petroleum authority? What's your target of the 15, I don't know, 20, here I said 15 to 20 billion. What of that have you planned to retain here? How are you going to do it? Why? Because again, our resources might leave the nation. How can we together work through this and retain more value? And what's your target? What extra are we going to do together? Uh, thank you. Um, so of this 15 to 20 billion dollars, that is uh, being invested during this phase, the target is 40%. 40%. The current target is 40%. So we measure, one of the things that we do as the authority is we look at each and every contract that's going out. And if a uh, foreign company is being contracted, they are required to, to submit what we call a national content plan. So if you say you're building a $2 billion facility, you tell us of the things you're going to procure on an annual basis. What are you going to procure from Uganda? What are you going to procure from outside Uganda? Who are you going to hire in Uganda? Who are you going to hire as a foreigner? And if you're hiring a foreigner, how long are they going to be here? They are not going to be here in, in perpetuality. Yes. So there are also targets in the law that say that if you, in your employment, in, man, in your management, in the first five years, this percentage has to be Ugandans. At operational level, this percentage has to be Ugandans. At technical, at, uh, technical level, this percentage has to be Ugandans. So those are the things that we regulate. Now, when you talk of how are we going to achieve this target, there is what we've been discussing, local content, trying to get, ensuring that Ugandan companies are getting businesses. And I, could, I can tell you from what the contracts we have approved as the authority to go out, close to six billion for the next one, two years. Uh, right now there are commitments of about 1.6 billion for Ugandan companies. So we measure the value that is being retained. That is one through local content. But secondly, we also look at the linkages between oil and other sectors of the economy. As, if, as we all know that oil is a finite resource, it gets finished. But we have agriculture, we have tourism, we have education and skills, so we are, we are also seeing how, what is that, we are measuring the impact that the sector can have on these uh, different economy, these uh, different sectors of the economy. For example, when you talk about agriculture, we have the second international airport being built in Hoima. The primary reason is to help, is uh, to facilitate movement of cargo that's going to be used on this project. Some equipment has to come by air. But after that, do the planes go back empty? If you have an agricultural hub in the area, then you can export. If people have been exposed to these standards that we are talking about, then they can export. Because after these three, four years, we are going to peak and then go down. So when we are going down, these businesses that have built, built capacity, what are they going to do? They have to think beyond. That. So, that, so that's what we are saying. You have to think beyond the oil and gas business. Otherwise, you'll peak and then you have all this capacity and it's wasted. So that's why we are working with different partners to look at the other sectors of the economy, agriculture, housing, health. Health is very big because all these tens of thousands of workers need health. When they fall sick, where do they go? So private investors are being encouraged to come and invest in health facilities, tourism. We have roads that have been constructed in these areas, high-class roads. And this area is near Maction Falls National Park. There's a circuit that goes even down to Queen Elizabeth. So if all these roads 
are constructed, much as they were constructed to facilitate move, movement. These are community roads, these are public roads, so that tourists can go ably. Instead of spending three, four hours, you spend one hour on a journey. You're saving time, you're saving money, and you're encouraging more people to come to the area. Education, once you have all these uh, institutes that are giving these certifications, so once you're training a welder, a welder who can work on a pipeline can weld anything. And so you have these dams that are being built in the country, you have the, the railway that's uh, in the offing, and so all these skills can be transferred to other sectors of the economy. So that is where what we are talking about. To attain this value, we have to look beyond the oil and gas sector. And the economic models that have been done show that outside this 15 to 20 billion in these three, four years, another nine billion uh, US dollars value is going to be, if we work at, uh, if we work together at it, then we can get additional value to these other sectors of the economy. The last area is, of course, the revenue that will come in once we start producing. We estimate about one to two billion dollars every year once we start producing oil. And the estimate is because oil prices fluctuate. So there are different ways that we retain value, national content, linkages with other sectors of the economy, and the revenue that will come in from production. Great. As we come to a close, probably my maybe last or second last question, back to retaining value. We know that this uh, the upstream industry will close three, five, seven years, but then after that infrastructure will be there, oil will be pumped. Tell us about the refinery because that's now the greatest value that this country will have. What, is the, what are the plans of the refinery because it's under your mandate? What are the plans of the refinery? Uh, we know that as much as there is all this talk about greening, we cannot go with the oil and gas sector because we, we can't manufacture anything without uh, plastics, chewing gum, name it, shoes, etc. And that's where the greatest actual value is for this nation. What are the plans? Because we've not seen anything coming up. What are the plans and how do we transit from this upstream now because we are going to invest, make some money? How then do we tap into? refinery and the opportunities around it. Okay, it's uh, not necessarily that upstream will go away because when we talk of our current resources, they've been, uh, the estimates now have been discovered in an area that's about 10% of the area that's licensed. Only so 10%? About 10%. So go, yes, so we go. have areas that uh, there's more exploration work going on and I will, I have my colleague Kato in the house, and that is an area that he specializes in, exploration work. So we have companies that are doing more exploration work to see if we have additional resources. So once we produce the ones that we are talking about, there is potential for additional so that uh, we can sustain production over a longer period of time. But as you said, in case there is no additional, what is, what is the plan? our refinery and all this other infrastructure. First of all, uh, we believe that the potential is there, so it's, in the, it's more likely that this infrastructure will be required beyond the 20, 30 years for the current resources. But the refinery, as you said, is a key project because uh, a lot of the benefits it has outside just producing diesel, petrol, etc. The refinery is also, the byproducts from refining are what we use for the petrochemical industry. These chairs we sit on, pharmaceuticals, uh, all the plastics, it is, it, there's a graphic that I'll share with you that says, that gives us almost 100 products that are byproducts from the refinery. And so we are developing the refinery. There's a private investor, the Albertine Graben Refinery Consortium. They've done the environment and social impact assessment, the engineering design studies, and uh, these are now being discussed. And we think that in the next year, next year in 2023, they'll also make the final investment decision that will give way to the construction works oh, for the refinery. Now, two or three questions. You're going to answer these ones quickly. How are you making sure that Hoima doesn't suffer pollution and environmental degradation? Mm -hmm. How can a circle participate in the industry? Uh, is the local content for locally owned companies or locally registered companies? We'll take those three questions. Okay. Uh, number one, environment degradation, and you hinted 
towards it. Uh, we are cognizant of environmental impacts of the oil and gas sector, but we see that environment and oil and gas can coexist. So we have frameworks in place, the environment and social impact assessment studies for each and every project that uh, document the potential impacts, but also the mitigation measures. And then we also have oil spill contingency plans that have been put in place and equipment being acquired so that in the like, unlikely event of an accident, it's like when you buy a car, you're not buying it to have an accident. But if something goes wrong, how prepared are you? Are you wearing your seatbelt, etc.? And then uh, there are also a number of tools. We work with the different agencies, NEMA, Uganda Wildlife Authority, that ensure that there are management plans for the areas where this work is going on. Communities are very important, and that is why uh, we ensure that the social aspects are also covered. These projects are on land. There's a lot of land acquisition going on. But aside from just saying you're compensating people, giving them money, we do what we call a resettlement also. Those who have lost their primary residence are given a replacement house of a better standard. And most of these are rural community in mud and water houses, but they are given permanent homes plus livelihood improvement activities, training in financial literacy, vocational skills, uh, they are given agriculture inputs, uh, if it's an area for cassava like Buliza, they are given better inputs for cassava, fishing, uh, beekeeping, and the like. So there's a lot of livelihood improvement that's going on for the communities in these areas. You also talked and mentioned about the energy transition and a movement that's saying that maybe oil will not be required for the, in the next 20 or 30 years. But for us in Uganda, we need to transition to cleaner energy. 90%, 95% of Ugandans rely on biomass, charcoal, cutting down trees, and that is what is killing the environment. And so we need to ensure that we are providing cleaner energy. The gas that comes from our oil resources is going to be used to produce LPG so that it can be available on the market and, and, uh, and cheaper for people to use. And so we think that for us, the focus as a country is to ensure that we transition from biomass to cleaner energy. And also as a developing country, oil and gas still has an important role to play in our economy, given that uh, the developments and the benefits that it brings. Secondly, on uh, Ugandan companies, is it a Ugandan-owned and a Ugandan-registered? Right now, the law provides certain, looks at value addition, because you can have a Ugandan-owned company by Pastor Chris that has a UK CEO importing everything from Turkey and China, that is not value. So right now, as we build capacity, we look at a Ugandan registered company. What do you acquire from Uganda? And when we are classifying a company as Ugandan, that is what we focus on. Who is your management? Who is your CEO? Who are you paying salaries? Where do you source your goods and services from? That is a Ugandan company. Ownership is important, but as you build capacity, you need to first start with value, retention, and addition versus looking at who owns the company. The last awesome. question was... So what we're going to ask is that, uh, I know I've got a message that Petroleum Thought is going to go online and there are so many other questions. So we'll go online and answer some of those questions and I hope you keep that promise. Yes. Uh, but I want us to celebrate Gloria for joining us this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, when we told her that the time we have said it's not enough time, and I know it's not enough. It cannot be enough. So we're going to encourage you one. We are going to have meet Gloria and, uh, and, uh, Alex. and Alex at the Brin Cafe. You can join us. But also, let's go to their offices and find out a lot more about what they do. So thank you so much for joining us this morning, friends out there. Uh, it's been an awesome session, and I know we've learned a lot, and there's still a lot more to learn. So let's seek out information. But as we usually do, one, I would like to remind you about the Thrive Breakfast. Our last session is this Thursday. They're going to share a link on the line. Thrive Business Breakfast has been every Thursday, and this is our last Thursday. Don't miss the last session. And as we normally do, we want to give you an opportunity. If you're out there, you just maybe bumped onto this link, or someone invited you or shared this link with you. We are a church that focuses, this service focuses on resourcing 
uh, business people to do business with biblical principles because God is very, very interested in your business. He's interested in your thriving and your success. So I want us, if you're out there and you've not given your life to Christ, who is the author and finisher of your faith, we take this opportunity to give it to you and say that you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you're out there and you want to do that, you can say this short prayer with me. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give my life to you, to surrender it to you because you're the author and finish of my faith. I surrender my life to you right now. Take it and do something significant with it. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. And if you've said that prayer with me, there's a number on the screen, 0775-642-449. 0775-642-449. Call that number and there's a pastor behind that line and they will tell you what to do next. But also if you're a businessman and you want someone to pray with you concerning your business, you can call that line and someone will be there to do that with you. So thank you so much for joining us uh, today and tune in next Sunday again. This whole month we are going to be covering the business, uh, the oil and gas sector. We're going to share stories of people who have been there and done business in the sector for us to learn. So thank you so much. Have a blessed Sunday. Stay right here for the next service at 9 o'clock. You're very welcome and have a great weekend.